But we are in the middle of this series called Reopen. Everyone say Reopen. And this whole series is really about what does it look like to reopen our lives after uh, such a long time of disruption and disconnection. Uh, What does it look like to, as the world around us reopens, to begin to reopen the world within us? And I, I would encourage you, if you've missed this series at all, to go onto the Canvas app and to tune into the previous week's teachings. We, we've talked about reopening your future. Corey Leak a few weeks ago brought a, a great teaching on what it means to reopen the church. Then a couple weeks ago, we talked about reopening selflessness. Last week, we talked about reopening generosity. And I saved the, the hardest message for last of this series. I saved the message that, to me, is, is going to be extremely hard to teach and was extremely hard to prepare for. And I would venture to say it's going to be the message that is the hardest for you to embrace as well. Maybe not when you first hear what I'm going to talk about, you're going to be like, oh, that's, that's easy. That's, that's something beautiful. Why, why would that be such a hard thing to talk about and live out in your life? But what I'm going to talk about today is difficult because over the past 18 months, especially in our country and in our world, what I'm going to talk about has been at an all-time low. And whether you believe in God or not, I'm sure we can agree that what I'm going to talk about has been running low in our world, in our country, in our jobs, in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our uh, friendships. This is something that, that, man, we have been missing for some time now. And yet I, I believe with a deep conviction that, that we need to reclaim what I'm talking about today if we're ever going to create a better future worth fighting for and a better future worth passing on to the next generation. Today I want to talk about what it looks like to reopen grace. I want to talk about what it looks like to reopen grace. Now, again, you probably heard that, and you're like, oh, I expected something way heavier than that, Travis. I expected something way more difficult than than reopening grace. I mean, but I think if we're honest, grace is really difficult if we want to live it out in our lives. Right, I think there's two things that we could pray for that are extremely dangerous to pray for. The first is to pray for patience. It's an extremely dangerous prayer, right? Because you know when you pray for patience, God is going to send you problems. He's going to send you some problems that will stretch you and grow you in your own patience. But I think there's a prayer that's even more dangerous and more difficult to pray, and that is to pray for becoming a gracious person. Because when you pray to become patient, God sends you problems. But I've noticed that when I pray for God to make me a gracious person, I experience grief. That that, that when we pray for being a gracious person, we're like, we love how that sounds, and it sounds like such a great thing. I've never met a person who's like, you know, I don't really want to be a gracious person. I I think grace is way overrated. Now, I've never met that person. All of us want in on grace on some level, shape, or form. But here's what makes grace so difficult, is that although everybody wants to be a gracious person, the problem is not everybody, as a matter of fact, I would argue very few want to love their enemies. And very few want to actually love and forgive and release the bitterness and anger that they may hold towards another person. Grace is one of those things that is very easy to receive, but it's really hard to replicate in our lives. Amen? And especially when we live in a world that's just a little bit angry. Have you noticed? I mean, have you noticed that people are a little on edge, a little angrier, maybe more than normal? I would say that people are more angry than I've ever experienced in my lifetime. There's, there's algorithms built by social media conglomerates that are leveraging your anger in order to create further engagement on their platform. They've seen how angry we are, and so now they're putting even more in front of us to make us even more angry. I mean, anger is like all around us. It's hard, isn't it, to be a gracious person during these angry times? Grace doesn't really compute. It's not always compatible with the options that our culture gives us, is it, right? Like, it's a dog-eat-dog world, right? That's what we say. We don't say it's a dog-forgive-dog world, a dog-love-dog world. In baseball, we don't see someone, uh, you know, swing three times and not hit the ball, and, and, and the umpire say, hey, you know what, three strikes, usually you're out, but because you have such a good attitude, why don't you go to first base? No, it's three strikes, and you're, say it with me, out. And for many of us, that's how we live our lives as well when it comes to our relationships and when it comes to those who've crossed us, harmed us, or offended us again and again and again. The culture tends to give us these options. You're either with me or you are against me. And so it makes being a gracious person extremely difficult. 
in the times that we find ourselves in. And so I want to talk about this. I'm not sure that this is going to be a perfect teaching, by the way. This is really going to be more me processing some of the things I've processed this week and what I've been thinking about this week. And, and it may not answer all your questions. It might actually create new ones. It, it may not put a bow on top of like, what does it look like to be a gracious person? But perhaps it'll start a conversation that you can continue on with your friends or roommates or, or loved ones that you can continue to seek out. How does it look to be a gracious person? in the angry world that we find ourselves in. So today we're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk a little bit about cancel culture. We're going to talk um, about getting stoned, and not the kind you're thinking, but a different one. And, And then we are going to talk about grace and what that might look like for our lives. So let's pray. God, we love you. And uh, this message is hard because... God, even though I'm up here talking about it, I struggle with grace. I struggle at times to extend it to people that have harmed me or hurt me or offended me, and um, I, I'm just going to guess I'm not the only one. So, um, But we believe that grace is powerful. I mean, it's at the foundation of this story that we're a part of, the story of Jesus. Because the story of Jesus isn't about good people getting to God. It's about a good God getting to people. It's about grace, radical, scandalous grace being offered to each and every one of us. And it goes against the grain of so much of what we're taught, what we're told to be true in this world. And so, God, I pray that today you would open up our hearts to receive this difficult message. And even more, God, I pray that we wouldn't receive it, just receive it, but we would go out and live it out in our relationships, especially in our relationships that include our enemies. Help us to love our enemies as you've called us to do. Um, We're gonna need your help on that, God. So we just open up our hearts and ask you to speak. And uh, God, we know that historically in in the Bible that giants tend to fall. Um, But Lord, right now we pray that the San Francisco giants would not. Um, We were a little concerned after last night's game, but God, in We know that your grace is big enough for the giants. So God, we pray that you would let these giants rise up and beat the Dodgers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right. So let's talk about reopening grace. Let's talk about this. We live in an angry time, angry world. I've uh, done a lot of, felt like I was writing an essay actually this week and preparing for this talk. But here's some things that I I read that I found to be particularly interesting. An article from the Washington Post uh, said it this way. Uh, the, the journalist said it this way. We'll have the words on the screen. He said this, we are in a big anger incubator. Does that sound about right? We are in a big anger incubator with three disasters superimposed on top of each other. The pandemic, the economic fallout, and the greatest civil unrest that we've seen in decades. And I'm sure you're sitting here and going like, I could think of like two or three more things uh, to put on that list. But the, the headline, we are in a big anger incubator, uh, resonates for sure. And according to a Gallup poll, uh, anger had already been on the rise. Some of us were like, we're angry because of 2020, and we think, okay, like, once we get past everything that took place in 2020 and some into 2021, then, then things will get better. But the truth of the matter is, according to Gallup, uh, certain Gallup studies, anger was already on the rise in the lives of Americans. According to one study in 2018, one poll concluded that American stress and their worry and their anger had intensified with 22% of Americans saying that they have felt angry within the past 24 hours, which was up from 17% a year earlier. And this was in 2018 before the pandemic. We are in a big anger incubator. And, and this isn't good, right? Because study after study also shows us that anger in the long term affects each and every one of us negatively. As a matter of fact, one study showed that an, anger, uh, an outburst of anger actually doubles the likelihood of you having a heart attack. It, it has an effect on your heart. It, it increases your risk of having a stroke when you live in this constant state of anger. It weakens your immune system. Uh, living in a constant state of anger is connected to worsening your depression. And in general, anger, when you do not ever get out of it, you live life in this angry mode all the time. It has enough to support to say that it actually shortens your life. So, so a fair question then is, why do we resort to anger? Why are we so angry? 
all of the time if there is enough study and research to know that it is not only affecting those around us, but even worse, it is actually affecting our own livelihood and health. Why are we continually so angry when it's so unhealthy for each and every one of us? Larissa Tiedens, a social psychologist and president of Scripps College in California, she has one theory as to why we, we tend to gravitate towards anger. She says this, she says, we know that uncertainty as both a cognitive and emotional state is one that people want to resolve. Duh, right? Like we all get that. We're like We don't like being uncertain. We don't like this feeling of not being in control. We want to resolve it. And she said, anger is one way we do that. By being angry about something, she said, you get to leave your feelings of uncertainty for a while and occupy a space and sensibility of certainty and clarity and confidence, right? Because like when you're angry about something, you're obviously convinced you're right about whatever it is you're angry about. I've never met a person who's angry about something, but then they're like, yeah, I'm totally wrong, Right, So in that moment when we're angry, in that space, we feel certain, we feel sure. And so according to Liz Tiedon, she's saying, hey, some of us choose anger because while the rest of the world is uncertain, we can at least be certain about what we're angry about. And so for some of us right now, anger isn't even about the realities around us as much as it's just us trying to find resolution. It's just us trying to survive. So the question I would like to invite us to reflect on today a question that is far too big for a 25 to 30 minute talk, but hopefully can continue to be processed beyond this morning's gathering, is this question, is anger the best way forward? Is anger our best way forward? If we are going to create a future we're fighting for, if we're going to create a future we're passing on to the next generation, then I want to invite each and every one of us as followers of Jesus to answer this question. Is anger the best way forward. Now, let me be really clear, and I, I spent a lot of time just trying to find out a simple question to ask, and, and, and this question was actually kind of hard because what I didn't want people to hear me say is that anger isn't helpful. Because can anger be helpful sometimes? Yes, anger can be helpful. Just watch the movie Inside Out, all the emotions, they're very helpful. <laughs> anger can be helpful. There is a place for all the emotions, including anger. Scott Wilson, a clinical psychologist and assistant press professor at Teachers College, Columbia University, he agrees that there's, a good, there's good that can come from doses of anger. And he said this. He said, like all emotions, anger is a response that organizes our thinking, our physiology, and our behavior so that we can most effectively face a particular type of challenge. He goes on to say that because anger doesn't feel good, it forces us to Resolve that situation as quickly as possible. And an article in the Scientific American cited research that confirmed this very uh, thought process and said that anger was actually capable of providing a creative boost, largely because anger gives us a boost of adrenaline. So there's this idea here that a dose of anger actually makes you momentarily more creative. It gives you the, cre the, the, the energy, the desire, the will, the tenacity to find a solution to a problem that you're facing when you, when you have doses of anger. And I think all of us have seen that anger has done some good in the world, right? Anger has sparked movements like Black Lives Matter, an important movement where people say, we're done, we're putting a line in the sand, enough is enough with systemic racism, enough is enough with police brutality, we aren't going to stand by any longer, and out came this movement called Black Lives Matter that is fighting for racial justice and equity, and, and just so you know, we as a church believe that is a fight worth fighting. We don't believe that's just a social issue, we believe it's a gospel issue, because in the eyes of God, we are all equal, and the, the, the playing field is equal, and we should strive for that as well. But anger sparked that movement. Anger sparked movements like Me Too that have exposed people in power who were abusing that power and exploiting people. Um, and, and Me Too is an incredible movement standing in solidarity with victims and survivors of sexual abuse. See, anger has launched movements that have exposed historic and systemic injustices and abuse by those in power. Anger can do some good in the world. Another example of this is actually in China. At the beginning of uh, the 2000s and a little bit, kind of a little bit more than into a decade into the experiment known as the internet, 
I think the internet released in 1991. I could be wrong there. So about 10 years into that, uh, in China in the early 2000s, a new phrase slipped into Chinese slang. And I apologize if I, if I butcher this, but it is renru suso. Renru suso. And in English, it literally, literally means human flesh search. Now, this wasn't a literal search for human flesh because gross, right? Like that's not what this was, but it was a collective movement of people who would use this new thing called the internet to find information about people who have committed wrongs in order to expose these people who have committed wrongs in order to right those wrongs. So a collective movement of people went on what was called a human flesh search to right the wrongs of those in power. And many concluded when this first sort of happened that this sort of thing would never work in America. As a matter of fact, as late as 2016, an essay was written by Wei Wei Shen, a founding editor of the Tsinghua China Law Review, and she said this. She said, the human flesh search was a grassroots effort and was far more likely to arise in collectivist China as opposed to go-it-alone America. In other words, they were like, Americans don't really care about one another. So like this thing's not ever going to take off, but little did they know that two years earlier in 2014, a new word entered into mainstream vernacular here in America. In 2014, due to a misogynistic joke on an episode of VH1's Love and Hip Hop New York, anyone seen that show? Love and Hip Hop New York, little did they know they were about to change the way we talk. They were introduced to us a new word because in this particular episode, the phrase canceled was used for the first time. Now, the idea of canceling someone, especially those who abuse power, was not a new idea. But there was no language for it. And here, thanks to VH1, we were given a word that has become a regular and powerful part of our everyday vernacular and has created an entire culture around calling out oppressive people. And since entering the mainstream vernacular, the original idea of canceling someone in many ways has been reformed, re-explained, and some people would even say been deformed from its original purpose and intent. As a matter of fact, this past week, I threw out a question on my Instagram asking people to define the word cancel, as well as asking them, do they see cancel culture as helpful or harmful? Can grace and this cancel culture that we see around us, can they coexist? And it was really interesting to me, the responses that I got, and I got quite a few. It's no Gallup poll, but hey, it's a Travis poll, all right? And so I got enough responses to conclude that a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about this word cancel. Now, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on whether it's good, whether it's bad, or whether it's somewhere in the middle. And so although I'm not going to try and stand up here and, and, and make a case one way or the other, I, I do want to at least create some space for us to talk about it and to talk about where does this idea of cancel culture fit with us as a community if we're going to reopen grace individually and collectively. See, cancel culture has done, I'm just going to say this, I believe cancel culture has brought to light injustice in our world that otherwise was ignored or we did see or or ignored or historically uh, kind of uh, protected, such as racism and sexism. Cancel culture has brought to light these injustices. Cancel culture has effectively brought down powerful people who have misused and abused others with their power. As recent as R. Kelly, Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, we've seen again and again the powerful effects of cancel culture in calling out people of power who have abused that power. Cancel culture has fought to end unsafe and toxic environments that harm people. The Daily, a New York Times podcast, defined cancel culture in this way. Cancel culture is the total disinvestment in something or someone else, or someone. Cancel culture is the total disinvestment in something or someone. And I think a strong case can be made that there are quite a few things that have been canceled, have been called out, that should be canceled and should be called out. And so some good has come as a result of this word that entered into our vernacular in 2014. But while the origins of cancel culture are founded on calling out injustice and calling out oppressive people, to many, cancel culture has now become less about calling out and more about a digital mob casting out anyone and everyone that they disagree with. Right? 
That, that for some of us, this, this powerful movement of calling out those who've carried out injustice has now evolved into something more so of us casting out anyone and everyone we disagree with. Now, many believe that cult, cancel culture has become sort of the newest version of the human flesh search. That we're constantly trying to find who has done wrong, and then we begin to define a person by their worst moment. And we cast them out, never to return. One essay I read, and this essay, I think is important to note, was not written by a Christian, and yet I thought he raised some very important and interesting thoughts. Here's, here's what he said. He said, part of the problem with cancel culture is that it makes the confession of failures so much more difficult to achieve. Cancel culture makes us hide in fear. It makes us publicly pretend we are better than we are. It turns us all into liars. And the more we fear the exposure of our failings, the more we point the finger at others in hope of misdirecting the anger of the crowd. The problem is that, under Christian culture, it is believed that God is the ultimate righteous judge who knows all the secrets of our hearts. But this God is now dead in popular culture, and a God who would uh, judge with fairness and kindness has been replaced by the high court of the digital trial. And once sentenced has been passed, once, once sentencing has been passed, there is no coming back ever. But nonetheless, without some sort of personal redemption, let me remind you, this is not someone who's following Jesus. He writes this, without some sort of personal redemption, and I don't know what that is, those who recognize themselves as a wretch will look nervous at this crescendo of moral righteousness and begin to fear that one day the same people will come after us too. Indeed, without the existence of redemption, we should probably all be afraid of vigilante moralism. I think that's a really interesting perspective. If I were to sum it up, what this gentleman who does not follow the way of Jesus says is he says, moralism without grace should frighten all of us. And moralism without grace should frighten all of us because who could possibly stand up and say that they have nailed it in all ways, that they are perfect at all times? And so my question is, is anger the best way forward? Not is it helpful, it can be. Great things have come out of this notion of canceling and calling out injustice. But is it the best way forward, anger? And if not, what is the best way forward for us as followers of Jesus? And so with that, I wanna look at a powerful story in John chapter eight, where we see a woman who was caught in her greatest failure and she is brought before literally the mob. And Jesus is given one of two options. We either condemn her or you are condoning her sin. You either condemn her for her sin, Jesus, and cast her out, or you are condoning her sin. And what we'll be surprised to see is that Jesus doesn't accept the two rules he was given. Instead, he forges a third way, the way of grace. And this is where I want us to jump in. John chapter 8, verse 3 says this. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again, and he wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said this, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This is one of those interesting stories that actually wasn't in the original biblical manuscript, by the way. It was later added. So some don't know, did this actually happen? Was this an oral story that had been passed down from generation to generation? All we know is this, that the biblical authors thought this story was so important that they, they put it right back in the book of John when it originally wasn't in there. My guess is because the original biblical authors really wanted us to know something about how Jesus worked. 
My guess is that Jesus, they, they really wanted us to know that the way of Jesus does not look anything like the way of the world. That the way of Jesus is difficult to accept, but it's beautiful when it's deployed into this world full of shame and anger. Now, there's a lot to talk about in this story, but one thing that I've always found interesting, and you probably noticed it, is that only the woman is being accused here. Last time I checked, it takes two to tango, right? And the religious leaders who say they're doing this in the name of preserving the law of Moses seem to have forgotten in Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, the law of Moses, that if a man and woman were caught in an affair, according to the law of Moses, both the man and the woman should be stoned to death. So you have these religious leaders who are saying that they're here to protect and police the, the law of Moses when they themselves are not actually following the law of Moses fully. So they're being hypocritical. And second interesting thing to me about this story is that Jesus starts writing in the dirt. Anybody else find that a little odd? The woman is being brought before Jesus with her life on the line, and Jesus starts doodling in the dirt, which should be the sermon title, Doodling in the Dirt. I'm going to, that, that works. Well, what gives? Like, why is Jesus doing that? No one really knows. But one very popular theory is that, that many believe that while these Pharisees and religious leaders were throwing this woman in the middle of her sin in front of the crowd that Jesus was actually writing down the sins of all the Pharisees in the dirt. So he was writing greed, maybe an affair, maybe a pride. I don't, I don't writing their specific sins in the dirt. And, and I just want to that to be true because that's an amazing move by Jesus, right? <laughs> like, like, like Jesus then does the ultimate judo move and he says, hey, look, yeah, sure, you can stone her. But he who has no sin, you're the first one. You, you get to be the first one to throw the stone. In Hebrew, the word is mic drop, right? Like, that's what, that's what Jesus does here, right? right? I mean, we all, whether you even are familiar with Jesus or the teachings of Jesus, many of us know this moment because of how powerful it is. And so what we have here is a story where Jesus is presented with one of two options by these religious leaders. You're either going to cancel this sinner, Jesus, or by not canceling her, you are condoning the sin. Either way, Jesus was going to lose if he chose one of those two options. But instead of choosing one of the two paths he was given, Jesus instead forges a third way, and instead of canceling the sinner, he cancels the sin, and he extends compassion to the sinner. While the mob was attempting to define her as worthy of death, Jesus defined her as worthy of love and restoration. And for the past 2,000 years, we can't stop talking about it. See, I feel that some of us, we feel in the world that we live in today, pressured with one of two options. You're either with me or against me. You're either supporting them, and if you do, then you're against all these other people. And if you support all these other people, then you're against them. Have anyone ever felt that sort of pressure? That we're given this sort of binary set of rules. It's this way or that way. And I'm telling you today that if we are going to create a future we're fighting for, that we've got to break the rules and create a better way. That we've got to create, we've got to create a better way. And the better way will be a harder way, but it still we, will be a better way because the best things are usually the most difficult things, Right? Grace is anything but easy, just ask Jesus. And yet this is what Jesus does. He's given these binary set of rules, and instead of going with the rules he was given, he breaks the rules, and he creates a third way, the way of grace. And I believe that if we take Jesus seriously, then we have to recognize something about Jesus. And that is that Jesus' circle of friends included a betrayer, a thief, and a prostitute, just to name a few. Jesus was willing to have compassion on the worst of the worst, the baddest of the baddest, and the guiltiest of the guiltiest. And Jesus moved towards those that everyone else moves, moved away from. He refused to denounce those who had been denounced. He refused to dismiss those who had been dismissed, dismissed, and he refused to shame those that everyone else was shaming. He wasn't just friendly to sinners. He was a friend to sinners, so much so that the religious elite struggled to take Jesus seriously because they thought to themselves, how could a rabbi like him hang around people like that? But Jesus didn't come to play the rules of the world. He came to give us a new set of rules to live our lives by. He came to forge a new way, a new way paved by grace that would be extended to all people. Jesus 
invites us to be grace-giving people in a stone-throwing world. And I love how Maya Angelou said it. She said, hate, it has caused a lot of problems in the world, but it has not solved one yet. And I think you could argue that grace has not caused any problems in the world, but it has solved a ton. I think we're invited into this way. See why this is difficult, though? Because I'm not talking about just somebody who said something you didn't like. I'm, I'm talking about people that have truly offended you. People who maybe even have harmed, people who have maybe even... They've been toxic in your life, and yet Jesus never seems to qualify who gets grace and who doesn't. He seems to always believe in this third way that we are to live out the same scandalous grace that was extended to us and extend it to those who are in need of it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, Paul, and uh, Paul would have known a thing or two about the grace of God. He himself said he's the worst sinner of them all. And here's what he says in Galatians chapter five. He says this, for if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, God's grace. Let me read that again because it's important that you actually hear what Paul's saying here. If you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, in other words, by doing the right things, by being a good person, by checking all the boxes, Paul says, hey, you've actually been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. This verse is extremely challenging if you hear what Paul is saying. It's challenging because it turns everything that we hear and believe in our culture here today, it turns it all on its head because I don't know about you, but I wouldn't qualify someone who's just trying to do all the good things, trying to be a good person, trying to fall. I wouldn't qualify them as those falling away from grace. Who would I qualify? I would qualify R. Kelly. I would quali qualify Harvey Weinstein. I would qualify uh, the Karen that blew up on social media. I would qualify the, the toxic and broken politician that is greedy and, 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 and creating harm in the world. I would say those people, obviously those people, have fallen away from grace. And yet Paul, he turns it all on its head. He says, actually, no, it's the person who's trying to be perfect, who's who actually believes that they're not in need of grace. They are the ones who actually have fallen away from it. Now, is this a time where I say, you're no different than R. Kelly? No, I hope you're different than R. Kelly. Like, that you're no better than Harvey Weinstein? No, I hope you're better than Harvey Weinstein. But what I am saying is that Paul here is saying that those who fall away from grace are the ones who think that they aren't in need of it for themselves. R. Kelly needs it, Harvey Weinstein needs it, Karen, the Karen needs it that you saw, your enemy needs it, and so do you, so do I. Like all of us are in need of this radical grace from God. And why as followers of Jesus do we strive to allow grace to forge a new and better way? Why are we willing as a church to say, we're gonna, we're gonna break the rules that we were given because we wanna create a new world and we can't create a new world with the same rules. We need new rules, a rule called grace. Why is it that we can believe this with such conviction? Why must we believe this with such conviction as followers of Jesus? And here's why, Colossians 2.14 says this, Jesus, talking about Jesus, said he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. So before we were ever talking about canceling people, Jesus was canceling first. But take note of what Jesus canceled. Jesus canceled sin, not the sinner. Jesus canceled sin, but not the sinner. Jesus canceled sin, but he refuses to cast out the sinner. And in a world that likes to define people by their worst moment, Jesus instead defines others by their truest identity. A person who is dearly loved and dearly pursued by God. So can anger be helpful? Yes. In some ways, absolutely, anger can be helpful. Can canceling be helpful? Yes. When we're calling out injustice and brokenness and sin and evil in the world. But can anger ever lead us forward into a better world? I don't think so. Not in the long run. Because anger will never do what grace can. 
anger will never lead us to places that grace can lead us. And if you don't believe me, just look to Jesus. It was his heart for all people and grace that he was willing to extend to all people that led to an empty tomb and to the hope of renewal of all things. May we follow in the steps of Jesus and re a people that reopen grace so full of anger. Let's pray.